right, we're here right now with J. Ryan Straddle. Your book is Kitchens of the Great Midwest. It's great to have you. First of all, welcome to Book Me Now on PBS.org. Thank you. Yeah. Your book is getting enormous buzz. I don't know if you've been here all week, but you walk on the floor in there and people are like, have you read Kitchens of the Great Midwest yet? There's a lot of discussion about it. Wow. It's one of those books that people are pointing at as the one to watch for the fall. Tell me a little bit about yourself, first of all. It's about a Minnesotan family. You're a Minnesotan. Right, yeah. Tell me a little bit about where you're from and how that influenced the book to start there. I grew up in Hastings, Minnesota, which is a small town uh, south, of Red Wing, uh, south of St. Paul and north of Red Wing. And um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s when there wasn't a lot of emphasis on eating healthy. I think I grew up in a family and at a time where eating for convenience and speed were the premiums. And now uh, my father's got a generous garden. He's one of the healthiest eaters I know. And I feel that this evolution is typical of a lot of Minnesotans and typical of the country at large. And I wanted to write a story about a character's culinary evolution from the era I was born in, in 1975, to uh, today's culture of foodies and locavores. Yeah. yeah, well you've tapped into something pretty strong that's happening out there, but I love the Midwestern tinge to it all. The fact that there's like potlucks thrown in there and all the other elements. Tell me about your own sort of thinking about your own culinary background and growing up. Thanks, yeah, I absolutely love the food of the Midwest. I. Um, like right now it's rhubarb season. And this was around the time of year where we would get dolmens of rhubarb from neighbors who grew rhubarb in excess. There's not a lot of things you can do with rhubarb. <laughs> There's the pie. There's pie. I'm not and... sure what else. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, usually you, you know, take the edge off with strawberries or something a little sweeter. Um, and so I, I, I've been traveling the country for this book and I've noticed rhubarb everywhere, even in uh, environments that I would consider a little more hostile to rhubarb. I was just in England earlier in the month and they're into rhubarb, you know, um, where the Russians are into it. But um, I wanted to capture some of the foods, some of the traditional foods of the Midwest. I mean, right now, you can get just about anything in my hometown. But I, I grew up in an era where I'm not sure if I saw an avocado until I moved to California. You know, now you can get them in Hastings. But in the 80s, I don't I think it was pretty exotic, you yeah. know. Um, I grew up in a world of hot dishes, of s salads that may or may not contain a vegetable. You know, salads <laughs> being you know, jello or meat or yeah. jello and meat. Well, we share similar <laughs> upbringings, I think. Yeah. yeah, and I touch on that a little bit, but I might have to hit salads and rhubarb a little stronger the second time. Uh, the recipes in this book, most of which are pulled from, are inspired by my great grandmother's recipe book from Hunter, North Dakota, from her Lutheran church is pretty heavy on the bars recipes. And that's another word that I often have to define to non-Midwesterners. When someone asks me, well, what's your favorite dessert? I, I could say bars. And I'm like, oh, you know, like, and, and, and I, just growing up with them, uh, it's somewhat hard to explain it to someone who doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. it's absolutely, we, we speak our own language in the Midwest. We're both, we talked earlier from the Midwest and we have our own way of doing things. And yeah. certainly we ate a lot of the same foods it would sound in the 70s. But let's talk a little bit about the book so people understand. There's a, a foodie back, there's a, a strong foodie culture that goes through the whole thing. Um, but tell us a little bit about your main character, Eva Torvald, who is, uh, becomes this incredible chef in the book. Uh, Eva is a young girl who grows up in West Des Moines, Iowa, uh, as a young foodie among parents who love her but don't really participate in her passion. And that style of upbringing or that conflict is something I see a lot. It's, I experienced myself as a kid growing up in Minnesota who loved books in a hockey town. I mean, my hometown has put people in the NHL. Yeah. Uh, not as many authors, a uh, few, but not as many. Uh, but I, w I felt like a bit of an outsider in a town where kids were learning to skate at age three. And I wanted to put even a similar situation where her impulses as a young chef, as a gardener, she's growing hot peppers hydroponically in her closet at age 11 uh, for recipes that she wants to make. I felt like, oh, this is analogous to a lot of conflicts that really passionate, intelligent, or motivated kids feel sometimes when they're not in the majority in their environment. And yeah, uh, I thought it was also really fun to write scenes like a birthday party and 
fourth grade where instead of bringing birthday cake, she brings vegan blueberry sorbet. Yeah. You know? That's just what she wants. Yeah. It's my birthday. I should bring what I like. That's right. Yeah. But you put actual recipes in here. You mentioned them earlier. I want people to know it's not necessarily a cookbook, but there are recipes in the right. book. Yeah. Uh, that yeah, come from recipes. your own family. Yeah. Yeah, I've read a few early reviews that doubt whether the recipes are real or not. Yeah. They're, they're real. They've been passed down for generations. They're the same high calorie comfort food that kept people warm in the winter and um, uh, bulked people up to go uh, you know, work on farmland in North Dakota and Minnesota. Yeah the, yeah, the story is one where I think, and the cover is beautiful. I mean, for anybody, oh, and it's probably been on screen a couple of times, but um, a real winner of a, of a cover. Yeah, Talk I'm about your lucky. name, Jay Ryan. <laughs> Um, when I asked, when we were first talking, I was like, does he go by Ryan or does he go by Jay? But it's, no, Both. it's Jay Ryan. No. Yeah, but I prefer Jay Ryan just because it separates me from the Jays and the Ryans of the world. There are a few other Jay Ryans out there, uh, oh. two of whom happen to also be Midwestern. But um, I was named Jay Ryan because my parents intended to name me Joseph after a great uncle of mine who had died right before I was born. Uh, Czech uncle affectionately referred to as Stray Chick Joe, Czech for Uncle Joe. But my Czech grandmother objected I um, don't remember exactly why, I think it was superstitious reasons, or just felt like it's a little heavy to name a child after someone who just died. But um, my mom took the cue from F. Scott Fitzgerald, she said, and said, how about we just name him J. Ryan, the J will imply Joseph, but it doesn't legally stand for it. On my birth certificate, it says J. Period Ryan. Really? So is their way of kind of getting that name in there without, you know, getting that um, homage to my great uncle right. without uh, angry grandma. Yeah, totally, un <laughs> totally understand. Um, so you're just starting now this this writer journey. You've yeah. you've done a lot of other things, and now you've got this book that's out in the world. Your life just changed suddenly. It's, What's that been like? That transition? Well, it's weird. It's I I'm not gonna lie. When you set out in life from a young age to want to do something, I knew from like five or six I wanted to be a a writer. Um, there were a lot of books in my house. Uh, my mom taught me to read at a very young age. And uh, when I was about five, on my favorite books, I would write on the inside, written by Ryan Straddle. Like I would <laughs> on the author write page. like in crayon, you know, just like, <laughs> like yeah, on like cars and trucks and things Practice that go. Like, signature. I wrote this, yeah. you know, not just property of J. Ryan, but written by J. Ryan, you know. That's just, funny. Yeah. Um, and I'd always dreamed of uh, writing a novel someday. And, well, what do you know? Like, once you do it, I mean, it took a long time. <laughs> but, but it... It recalibrates one's sense of uh, identity. I think, like, wow, now I've done this thing that I've you always are. wanted to do. You are. You said you've been going <laughs> around the country. It's, what, uh, what was pretty, it that took so surreal. long? What took so long about oh, it? To get good at it. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the advantage of having an MFA program, and I didn't even major in writing or English as an undergraduate. So I just read a lot, and I wrote a lot, and I felt, um, you know, I'm, I'm improving as a writer. Um, but I've got, I've got a ways to go. I feel like there's a lot more I can learn, a lot more tricks I can have up my sleeve. Um, but so far, I just felt like it took 10 years for me. Uh, it was about 10 years ago that I published my first short story. And, in the inter and it was a fr the first short story I wrote was published by the first place I sent it to. And I thought, well, this is easy. I'm the genius I thought I was. No, no, I wasn't. I spent the next four years just getting nothing but rejections. Like the next four years, between 2006 and 2010, everything I wrote was turned yeah. down everywhere. Rejection era. Yeah, it was, yeah. and that's exactly what I needed. Yeah. You know, to, be, to have to fight through it and improve and get better and, and frankly, read more. I don't think there's any better education for a writer than just read. Where did read, the culinary read. love come from? Did you work in restaurants before? Oh, I worked at a restaurant called the Steamboat Inn briefly in high school. The Steamboat Inn is characterized in a chapter of this book. It's where Will Prager takes Eve on a date in high school. It's a little too expensive for him. Uh, <laughs> and it was too expensive for me in high school, too. I worked there as a, like a custodian. Yeah. And that's the one restaurant I've worked in so far. Mostly I'm, I'm into food as an enthusiastic end user. Yeah. I make breakfast sometimes at home, but I'm not a three-course meal dinner kind of Chef, no, not at all. Not so with close. the Midwest, oftentimes it takes a while for things to kind of make their way in. Sometimes, but yeah. But Minnesota seems to have really embraced, and some of the parts of the Midwest really embrace that sort of, um, uh, the sort of food thing that's sweeping across the nation. Oh, yeah. That was one that made its way quickly to the Midwest. Oh, absolutely. And I think there was interest in it all along. I've always felt that uh, the Twin Cities had at least one or two of everything growing up even before the fascination with world cuisine and uh, the 
current trends in eating healthy or eating more mindfully, I felt that there were options in the Twin Cities. There were vegetarian restaurants, all kinds of ethnic restaurants. And I went to all of them, as many as I could, in high school. As soon as I could drive, I was going to you know, the Barbary Fig in St. Paul. I was going to Sawati Thai, um, uh, Fujiya, just hitting all of the... Were there others like you in high school, or were you just like on well, a track? Well, there was at least one other, my yeah. high school girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah, who is also an enthusiast. That's not really normal. I mean, most kids in high school are still breaking out of the McDonald's days. I mean, they're like, yeah. you know, to step forward into a real cuisine world. I was spending my disposable income on ethnic food. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of students, a lot of high school students like that now, and there probably are even hundreds, if not thousands, of teen food bloggers. Yeah. But at the time, the internet didn't exist. We had no way of knowing if there were other kids like us. We just knew that's, that's what we wanted to do on a Friday and Saturday night was, you know, have some injera at an Ethiopian restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a perfect night, actually. Well, thank you so much, Jay Ryan Straddle, for being here at Kitchens of the Great Midwest, a beautiful book, wonderful debut. Excited to see that you broke through and that you stuck with it. Thanks. We're glad to have you here and to be able to read your book. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to have